across the country for our pyramid search uh, system and effort. As uh, you all, I think, are already familiar with the Gopher Pendleton story, uh, as I'll advertise this here, I'll just read the initial uh, quote here from the Daily Monitor, that this is, this is going to serve as a introduction to Grasshopper, visual description using Grasshopper and the Pendleton Gopher Mystery. Just, just a few disclaimers before we uh, go into the syllabus and cover uh, piece by piece and also give you a brief overview of the project service structure that because the source is visual description using Grasshopper, it assumes that you have a basic understanding of the method and all you need really is to be able to orbit, pan, which I will be explaining some of these things, but if throughout the semester you find yourself lost, then I strongly encourage you to take on the extra task of learning some of the basics of Rhino, utilizing some of the tools available on the internet. And I've also compiled all those tools specifically for you to learn Rhino and Grasshopper outside the limits or the bounds of the internet. So with that in mind, let's go over and, and discuss the structure of the project server and then we'll explain, I'll explain the, the, um, the syllabus. Right now, the project server folder actually does not exist, but it will launch tomorrow and I will send you an email which will also notify you of the project server structure and format. But if you click on the file for the summer here, so our September section 87, 9, 4, 6, you see that most of my courses are organized in these four basic courses, course material, project, students, and courses. Whatever material you want to have, you can create a folder, your last name, your final first name, all caps, and create or put in, store in there whatever file you want. The syllabus is where you'll find the course syllabus here. Obviously, it's 600. This is my own personal computer, so you'll, you'll see some files here that you won't see on the project server, like the InDesign document, which I'll still uh, give you to edit. But you do have the PDF of those. And then the summer calendar, which is something that will constantly update as the semester progresses, and I will update it in the syllabus. Course material, this is where you can find our latest readings, the two required readings for the course, which is Grasshopper, Primer, and then Simple Mathematics. And by required, I mean they're really helpful and having them pulled up as you're learning Grasshopper and thinking, beginning to think mathematically about certain design tasks, because they have, they're really great at breaking down the complexity of, of scripting and visual scripting specifically into a subcomponent. I think these two books make an excellent um, overview of how to begin to think that way. And then the other two articles, they're just articles on computational thinking and computational design thinking that some of the leading names you see, therefore you'll also be interested to read them. They'll give you a really good overview of what's going on in, in the world. References, this is where you have um, the online tutorial. The Grasshopper Primer is available also in an interactive PDF online. I have other just historical links giving you, positioning you in the context of scripting and where we were and where we are. Digital Toolbox is probably the one that you're going to be exploring the most, especially if you don't know Rhino. Digital Toolbox has some excellent tutorials on learning basic, intermediate, and advanced Rhino modeling and so on. And then the seminars, the course is divided in seminars. There will be eight seminars. There will be an introductory seminar. And all the material, video content, do whatever supporting material that I will be posting will be found in the folder of pro or the co folder corresponding to the course. And then scripts, this is where you're going to find all the project-related material. So far, it's just a basic update of everything that I have, some of the links 
I'm not saying I usually have students submit their projects here or since this is an online course, I want you to actually submit your project via email and that process is shared out in the course. So once once you conduct the organization of the project survey, once again you'll have uh, access to potentially a brand new student on the team. So now let's go over the syllabus. As I as I have said that this is an introduction in the intro introductory course to video scripting which means that we're going to go over some concepts in computer science that we we have to go over really to learn scripting let alone video scripting and so some of these concepts that in the computational thinking world they're known as decomposition pattern recognition and extraction algorithms so the industry, the AEC, Architectural Engineering, construction industry is heading in this direction where if we could automate certain design tasks, why not do it? It, 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 it makes our workflow more efficient. It gives us more accurate models, which I think the hope is that would lead to more accurate construction. And it will also eliminate some of the duplication in production and, 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 and office work. So part, part of that process, when you approach a design, you have to kind of decompose the design problem into its subcomponents. And once you, once you decompose it into its subcomponents, then patterns would begin to emerge. Those patterns are then extracted and developed into algorithms that could help expedite and automate the design. So for the project that we're going to be exploring, which is basically a, a basic rectangular footprint house, I'm calling it a tiny house. It's, 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 it's the life of the tiny house community that has sprung up in recent years. So it utilizes some of the parameters from the motor vehicle federal laws, such as maximum uh, vehicle limits and increments of vehicle length and maximum vehicle height. And it will also utilize weight calculations and structural thicknesses and spacing and all that stuff. And obviously there, there's, there's, a, there's a different roof profile, right? So the, 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 the project is going to take all those different parameters, read them into a script, and then the final output would be a basic structural model that you could use to export out to the architectural team, MEP team, structural team, or you could do an actual material takeoff and cost analysis from within the grasshopper environment, which we will do in the last seminar. So that's, that's the project overview, and the script that you see here is, 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 is a screenshot of the actual script that you will have at the end of this course. The course structure is, I think it's, as I've already said, it's, it's seminar based. So each video will be approximately an hour long and you should probably budget about four to six hours to go through each video, each video, which will equate to roughly 48 hours of, of classroom time or, or course time, which is how many hours a 3 credit hour course takes during the summer. Uh, obviously, there's we're not meeting physically anywhere, so there's no course vending. But I strongly recommend that you keep up with the material as it becomes available. Falling behind on the material would 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 drastically slow you slow down your your progress. And while it's technically true that you can bracket all the videos for the last week, scripting involves a lot of troubleshooting, a lot of error correction. And you want to give yourself the time to do that. So it's not just a matter of following the tutorial and repeating what I say. It's also troubleshooting your own mistakes as you come across them in the visual script environment. I already talked about the assigned readings. They can be found, obviously, on the project server. Required resources for you to do the things that this class is, this course is requiring of you. You need Rhinoceros 5 from the latest uh, version of, of, of Grasshopper. And to install them, I gave you links to download and install them. Grasshopper is free. A Rhinoceros, Rhinoceros 5 student copy or educational copy is like 300 bucks. You can download a trial of Rhino and you can 
have that trial for 90 days. So you could potentially have a free rhino for the limits of your split. Of course, evaluation would be based on your script. Your script is either going to work or not work. Obviously, it's not, it's not pass fail, but for you to get an A, you, of course, will, it's almost a guaranteed A if you go through the tutorial, put in the time you, or go through the seminars, put in the time that the seminars require of you, complete the script, and if the script works, then you get an A. If the script doesn't, then points get deducted based on where the, where the script failed. Your final deliverable would be a compressed folder with your grasshopper definition and your rhino file following the naming convention listed here and it will be due July 7th at 6 p.m. Central Time. So just keep in mind that it's Central Time, 6 p.m. Central Time. So wherever you are in the world um, doing this, just keep in mind that it's tied to time zone. The basic calendar on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I will be publishing his seminars, and you'll go over them whenever you see fit. So basically, there'll be a total of eight seminars, hour-long seminars, and it'll take you, I, I, bu I would budget four to six or eight hours, so four to six hours for each seminar. And the seminar constructions are listed. This schedule is subject to change based on the the evolving nature of the semester and what follows is just standard university and department procedures and policies and what I am required to go over with you is the non-discrimination clause the University of Kansas prohibits discrimination on the basis of race color ethnicity religion sex national origin age ancestry disability status as a veteran, sexual orientation, marital status, parental status, retaliation, gender identity, gender expression, genetic information, and the university's program and activities. Please contact the university coordinator at the Office of Institutional Oppor Opportunity and Access, iowa.ku.edu, with any inquiry to report discrimination or if you need guidance on discrimination complaints, please call the office at 785-864-6414. There you will find an easy complaint of discrimination form for reporting discrimination. If you need guidance on discrimination complaint or wish to report discrimination, please call or email the office. The Department of Store is also available to speak with you and assist you through this process. Call 911 for emergencies at the Public Safety Office for non-emergencies. And KU Crime Stoppers are also available at the following numbers. I am also required to report any discrimination that occurs. So if you don't feel comfortable reaching out to the Office of Opportunity and Access or the Department Store, you can let me know however you see fit. And then I am responsible to forward that on to the, the Department Store, which currently is Jason. So with that in mind, I want to go over Rhino and Grasshopper, just the basics of the two interface and show you a, an overview of the, ov of the overall script and what it will do. And then seminar one will actually begin to go in the individual components and detail them out. So with that in mind, wherever, whatever computer you're using, I like to start Rhino by going to my start menu scrolling down to my R's and find Rhino and just go in to whatever it is. Rhinoceros, Rhinoceros 5. And the splash screen can give you very quick, um, very quick shortcuts. You can open a file, you can click on a recent file that you've been working on, or you can select a template. The template I like to select is small object entries. And that saves me in step by not changing the units manually, and I can always make sure that I'm working in entry. But if you didn't do that, it's fine. You can just go to File, New, and then select Small Object Entry. And if you happen to open a pre-existing file that utilizes different inches, millimeters, or feet, or whatever, you can just simply type in units, units, pl plural, and you'll get the units dialog box or document properties dialog box and under model model units you can change its name 
So the basic interface in Rhino is composed of the menus, the menus on the top bar, the command line, the tabs to the toolbars, the layers display and properties panels on the right side, and on the left side you have your basic model and toolbar. And on the bottom you have the tabs for the different views, and underneath that are your smart features. So the command line is where you just type in whatever command you either know or you can think of. So I I actually learned much of Rhino by just typing in whatever I want to do. Like let's just say I want to install a line, I want to just say type in line, and then all the possible commands with the word line will come up. And I, over the years, I kind of intentionally explored a lot of the commands and learned Rhino that way. But you can also activate the commands from the icons. So the commands are all divided into these toolbars or tabs on the top. And on the left side, they're just toolbars. And each tab is divided into a group of commands. And each group is called a toolbar. And you can um, access a lot, all of your toolbars by right-clicking on this, on this bluish bar show toolbar and here are all the available toolbars for modeling and editing in Rhino and you can click on one and it'll come up on your canvas. Generally speaking the toolbars that you will need are on the screen. It's only in very advanced cases where you have to access these toolbars here. So on the left side is, is your main modeling toolbar and you can see that by almost every icon there is a bottom right corner arrow that you can click on to expand the collection of commands underneath of this icon. So the most common line type used is polyline so that is the one that you can just activate right away but if you want another line type let's just say a single line segment or line segment that starts in midpoint then you can click on that down arrow to activate one of those features. Or alternatively, you can click on that gray bar and drag the expanded form of that toolbar line onto the canvas. And then, of course, it, once you don't need it or once you're done with it, you can close out. So at any given point, if I am doing, if I'm working full time on a project, I'll probably have four to six and sometimes even eight separate toolbars floating on my canvas. The right side of the screen holds the properties panel, layers, display, and the help menu. The help menu, like any software, is, is the best you know, support that you can achieve. It has every possible thing there, and you can just ask it questions or type in keywords, and you'll receive some sort of information that can help you with whatever problem you're troubleshooting. And then what makes up really about 85 to 90% of, of the interface is are the four viewports and you can see that these three viewports their label is light gray and this one is dark blue that means this is my active viewport if I click on this viewport this switches to the active and so on I can click to activate a viewport but I can double click the viewport name and that view will be maximized I can double click it again it will be it will go back to the four viewport split menu I can actually, I can also flip over or flip through my viewport by the tab menu on the bottom. So if I have one maximized and I want to go to perspective, I can just click on perspective and now I'm in perspective. You can also do control tab that goes forward through the view, control shift, shift tab goes backward through the view. And then for my smart controls, I usually like to have ortho, O snap, smart track, and gumball on. And under O snap, make sure that end, point, middle, center, intersection, perpendicular are all checked. You can, of course, activate and deactivate the smart smart track. So with that in mind, if you have if if you have you have Rhino fully installed and Grasshopper installed, and as in the syllabus you have resources there to show you how to do that. You can type in Grasshopper in the command line and if it's installed correctly, an option for Grasshopper will come up. You can select it 
click on it, hit enter, and then Grasshopper will load. If you have extra plugins installed for Grasshopper, like for Scale Robotics, it will tell you that it's loading. We will only be using one extra plugin, and I will direct you to where to download that and how to install it later on in the semester. So this is the basic interface for Grasshopper. Rhino is still running, so we can minimize or, or, or shrink the Grasshopper window. And you can see that Rhino is running in, in the background. So really, Rhino, at least roughly speaking, almost always just serves as a viewport for Grasshopper. So you're doing all of the work in the Grasshopper environment, and Rhino is just, it, it serves as a, as a as a render engine for what you're doing so you can visualize the actual code. I like to work with Grasshopper being maximized because I'm, I'm, I'm doing all scripting and I'm, I'm not going to visualize the script and code later on. So I'm going to maximize it. Here with these, um, with these icons, these just give you shortcuts of the latest files that you've been working on that you can open to edit it. Of course, you can go to the file menu and open and search for a specific file if you want. So the top bar of the Grasshopper window is your traditional menus drop, drop bars, and then it's followed by the path that holds different toolbars that hold different things. So this is, for example, the par params or parameters tab. Under the parameters tab, you can go to input, for example, that's the input toolbar. And under the input toolbar, there is, um, you can bring down a number slider. And now it's telling you to click somewhere on the canvas to place a number slider. And there it is. So now I have a number slider that slides from 0 to 1 on my canvas. I can select the number slider. It turns into green, telling me that it's selected. And I can hit delete. And it deletes it. It doesn't delete sometimes for some reason that I, I just don't understand the, the keyboard correlation with Grasshopper breaks. So I have to shut down Grasshopper and and then turn it back on. So in this case, I'm not willing to shut it down. So I'm just going to go to edit and delete and I need to reload. So that's that's the general structure of Grasshopper. And this menu here where I'm under visualization menu you can choose to zoom in and out save the file draw lines and so on and this as I have said before is like this is your canvas where you drag and drop all these drag and drop all these components to create your script so I'm going to open my script which we will slowly construct throughout the semester and the script is really made up of these major parts, parameters, basic code, self-destruct and exclusion campaign, and task manager. And roughly speaking, the, the, the seminars will follow the construction of each section. So if, if, if I were to minimize or, or shrink the grasshopper window so that I can see Rhino in the background, or better yet, I can dock my Rhino window here and then I can I can have my I have can have a split screen workflow where I have Grasshopper on my right side of the screen and Rhino on my left side, and now what I can do is um, preview my geometry. I know I'm going fast. That's that's fine. You, you, I'm going to go over step by step what all these things I'm doing, and 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 the piece of code. There it is. So this is right now, this is acting as a viewport or, 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 or as a render engine for, for Grasshopper. So this geometry is actually being constructed in Grasshopper and it's just being viewed in the Rhino environment. So the script takes these parameters and, or it really takes question, design questions and turns them into parameters. So like, for example, what is this trailer height? If this is going to be a house on a trailer, this trailer must have a height and then the actual house name. So is the trailer height 24 inches off the ground or is it 36 inches off the ground? And the reason that it stops at 36 inches is that most tiny house trailers max max is 36 inches. 
and you can go all the way down to two inches off the ground or even zero inches off the ground eliminating the pitch. Typically I have that with 24 inches and then you have the shallow length um, you could just double click the slider and type in a value 26, 32 and so on and that will affect the structure in real time and then you have the legal width you can, the legal width is actually 102 inches. I am changing it to 120 so that I can actually overlap over the trailer and have a bigger house. And then the legal height is 160 feet, that's 14 foot six. And I don't want to bypass that for a really good reason. And that if you are above 14 foot six and you're traveling down the highway or you're transporting a house, go underneath a bridge you can risk you can risk the top of your house flying off as you as you drive down the highway so you probably want to just always have the upper limit of that parameter always be 14 foot 6 and that's minimum now this this strip also also has control over the structural grid right so I could I could right now if it says use cut to be mono I can change it to gable for example and I can go down here and change my roof slope go back and change it to mono pitch and I can also change the structural layout I can say every 12 inches in center and it will give me a structural number every 12 inches in center right so this is kind of it give you it gives you a combination to really control all the aspects of, 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 of designing a shell for a town so we could go down further and we could change the wall assembly layout. So right now it's telling you that this is using a two by two by eight, so it's 7.25 and two by eight actually is 1.5 inches by 7.25 inches. So if you're gonna use a construction grid or a structural grid that's 12 inches on center, you probably want a wall assembly that's going to utilize three by fours and can spin them all around. And there it is. So now your wall thickness decreases. And then the exterior finish, depending on the buildup, the exterior buildup, whether it's vinyl siding, rain screen, stucco, whatever, you can change the thickness of that from the basic structure. And then the interior finish, again, you can change the finish, the finish thickness from there. And the reason all these values are important is because at, so at some point the strip is making a calculation for overall or, or final or cumulative square footage and maximum volume. So this is why you want to involve in or compute in all these different parameters. The roof assembly, again, at 12 inches on center, you probably, the, the roof assembly, like the structure, the structure depth is dependent on the span. But again, for every 12 inches, you can probably get away with a, a two by six set. So that's 5.5. .5 and you can decrease that. And obviously you can increase this to 11.25 by 12 inches or two by 12, and that's the max that I have it at. And then the floor assembly is the same thing. We can increase the structure of the floor assembly to a two by eight, 7.25. And there it is. I can also change the direction of my mono pitch. So mono, mono roof orientation, east-west, this is north-south, this is east-west, east-west, sorry. And then depending on which direction, you can also flip it. And that's so that you could perform solar wind and spatial analysis. So traditionally, wh why, if you ask the question, why construction strips? Traditionally, this would be done manually. In a, in a traditional design office setting, let's say there's a d design team of three or four people, every, every iteration that I just went over would have to be constructed or modeled manually and then be able to be plugged in into a master model so that you can see how that works structurally or through systems, MEP, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, or um, just basic space swindling. Right? Every, every time the structure or the shape of the house updates, 
in traditional sense, you'll have to model all the stuff manually. Here, utilizing the script, you can produce all these different variations instantly and run your analysis without having to go back and model it from scratch. So the idea behind this, this visual script is to construct the rules that you construct the design instead of constructing a static design. And then of course we could, just based on the given parameters, we could export out to Rhino so we can do a, uh, a visual comparative analysis of the different, um, the different permutations. So I just baked that and now it's a live geometry in Rhino and I can go back in and flip over or flip through my different roof profiles very quickly and easily look at how your house changes so now we could turn off the visual display in Rhino and on the glass hopper and minimize the, the glass hopper and then we can right click on our perspective view pull up all the different um, shader options for the view and then click on render for example and you see that we had four different houses instantly made and again there's a let's say the time lag of a few seconds between them but again the idea is that in a traditional sense this would have to be donald manually now the other part of the definition that i haven't gone over is with every with every option every material thickness and all that stuff that gets plugged into a, a, a Excel spreadsheet and a cost of the structure, the exterior sheathing, interior sheathing, and the insulation of cap layer and it's giving you a total cost. The reason all these values are nulled out or there, there's a, there's a one-time error here is because my script, my, my, my Excel file is not updated yet but again as we progress through I will show you how to plug in all these different things and then we'll be on our way so that's that's really in a in 30 or so minutes the introduction for this course um, the following seminars a total of eight seminars will basically take this complex script and break it down into each and every component and show you how this component relates to the component next to it and how a cluster component can relate to another cluster of components creating a logic definition that could generate a design. So with that, I will um, talk to you mm, on the next video. Take care.